getting the microphone on there for a second. Let's get this going. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. In fact, today is day two of our um, look at the great work of William Blake, arguably the greatest artist in British history. And we're uh, because it is Easter, it's Easter Sunday today as we record right now, we're going to be uh, studying William Blake's resurrection from 1805 or circa 1805 and um, I'm super excited to do this painting we did a, a painting just a couple of days ago our version of the crucifixion let's just see how these turned out side by side there's the original and there's our version you know it's a little bit different of course as they always are. Um, and, you know, I, I think this turned out really good. I Honestly, I was a little bit um, ambivalent or maybe even upset with the way parts of it turned out until afterwards when I was looking at it um, later in the night. I was like, oh, yeah, actually, that turned out not too bad. I think we've done a good job. So, which is just a good reminder is, you know, it often our initial experiences of an artwork um, once we complete it, or maybe, hmm, I don't know, you just gotta let it sit, and then once the original, in this case, like, when we're replicating or studying art by other people, you have to let that original sort of disappear, and let the original, but your version, sort of take on its own life, and then you can kind of see it for what it is, and in this case, I'm happy with the way that turned out. Maybe not initially, but it's just always a good reminder, just to myself, and if anyone wants to take a lesson from it, feel free that um, I'm not necessarily the best judge of my own artwork while I'm making it, right? Okay, so um, let's look at the plan for today's painting. We're going to get the image transferred onto the canvas, and I'll show you how to do that and where to find that. We're going to stain it with some color. We're going to talk more about the biography of William Blake. Last time we sort of talked about kind of his initial the phase up until maybe age 24, and then we'll... We'll tackle the, the next 40 years of his life today and look at some of his, his work in maybe more detail. And then we're going to go um, uh, we might do under maybe not. I don't know. I'll have to think about it because, yeah. Anyway, let's do the background, foreground, background, background. You know, probably another four hour painting five hours maybe so if you're watching the video after it was recorded you can just use the timestamps to jump to the end maybe and see how it turned out and if you like how it turned out then hey welcome back glad that you liked how things turned out let's let's continue um, again if you're joining us also for the very first time hit the subscribe button as well as the notification button hit the notification bell because I'm not usually doing these episodes on a Sunday afternoon it's just because today's a holiday so um, it also um, I really appreciate when people comment on the videos or comment in the chat. That is always super helpful because it helps get more people to to tune in, right? It ends up showing more often in people's recommended videos, and that helps me. It helps the channel grow. Um, so, and if you like what we're doing, then the more it grows, the more likely I'm going to continue doing these. So if you also want to leave a donation to help support the channel, you can use the PayPal, you can use Super Chat within YouTube, although they take 50%, 40% or so of what you donate. So e-transfers or PayPal are probably your best bet so that um, your money goes directly to me and not to um, someone sitting on a beach somewhere drinking Mai Tais, as great as that sounds. Um, but <laughs> so let's, um, let's get started. Okay, so our first step here is to get the image onto the canvas. Now we could draw this, of course, but you can take my drawing class and learn a little bit about how to draw if that's something you wanna do. So instead what I've done is I've done a outline, a free downloadable template, which you can download from the Dropbox. And I'll show you where you can find that. 
So let's go to, there's a link to the Dropbox folder in the description below and you'll see the first few here are the resources for our introductory episodes. The next, I don't know, 70 or so, well, folders here are all dedicated to our most introductory, more simple paintings. There are some more complex ones in here. It's a little bit of a mess, but um, then the next 150 folders or so, each sometimes containing two, three, five paintings. Here we go down to 153, William Blake. And then we've got um, six files in here, three for each of the images we chose. Here's the ones we're working on today, Resurrection. And here's from uh, Thursday, Friday's paintings, the crucifixion here, or otherwise known as Jerusalem Plate 76, because it was part of a, of a, a long, or an epic poem called Jerusalem. I just also just make mention of the Facebook group. I encourage you to join the Facebook group and take a photograph of today's artwork, upload it to the Facebook group, and, and lots of inspiring, incredible stuff here. As well as each week, I or for each class, I do a little biography uh, introduction to each episode so you can kind of uh, have a little bit of historical background before we begin. So let's get to this template here and start transferring it. So I've just printed it out on my regular inkjet printer here at home and I'm going to transfer it onto this 9 by 12 sized canvas board. All right, so I've I ordered these off of Amazon. I like this particular brand. I think they they work really well. And um, they come wrapped in plastic. And when I get them, I take them out of the plastic and then I apply another layer of uh, white acrylic gesso onto the surface and then s let it dry overnight and then sand it the next day. And what that does is helps produce a really nice smooth surface to draw on or paint on and or draw on. Um, so now I just put this carbon transfer paper underneath. This is, it's actually graphite transfer paper that I've put into this envelope. And you can see I've used it many times. In fact, today's might be the last day I use this particular sheet because I've gotten, um, you know, probably 20 paintings out of that one sheet. So I think it's time for it to retire and drink Mai Tais on a beach. Thank you, carbon paper, for your service to art. And so mostly I'm just gonna trace out these outlines pretty quickly. I'm not gonna do all the details like fingernails and all the, each strand of hair that I drew here. Cause all, all of this is gonna get covered up with paint. So there's no point in trying to preserve all these pretty little details. I mean, I like drawing all these pretty little details when I'm doing the outline. For me, that's fun, and it's almost like a little bit of a, it's a kind of a way for me to prepare for the artwork. It's like a dress rehearsal or something. I get to spend an hour or two with the image thinking about how I'm going to um, uh, proceed. Okay. I just rotated that carbon paper so that I can go a little bit 
wider. I should have done that earlier. I was thinking about it and then I was like, ah, oh, maybe not. And then it's like, why not? Why? Yeah. Sometimes we think about doing things and then don't do them. And you just tell yourself, you're wondering to yourself, why? Why am I not doing this? Who cares? Just do it. so that that way all those lines go right to the edge it's also a good idea to check every once in a while like for instance like oops i forgot to do the face and again there's lots of details in this face so Yeah, well, this is that which means, and also because I'm going kind of quickly as I outline it, it, probably not a lot of those details are going to make it all the way through. So that I'll probably be doing a little bit of revisions as I go. our radiating beams Now, you know, one thing as I'm doing these beams, I, I start thinking like, oh, you know what? I, I really did beams like this in the previous painting where there were beams of light, but um, not quite like this. So did I make a mistake with the last painting by, by putting those beams, or really amplifying those beams of light where they maybe we're not so such a important part of the crucifixion painting um, I don't think I made a mistake I mean it just makes it a little bit different and nothing wrong with different I mean, I could, for instance, with today's episode, minimize the beams. I took. Um, but I think, you know, the way that we're going to paint today's painting is going to be different anyways. Different set of colors. And maybe the fact that they will be have similar motifs, but painted slightly different with, you know, different set of colors might make them look like a really nice um, uh, 
uh, series, you know, like, I mean, they, they they were never really seen or presented this that way when they were created. They were done for two totally different books. So, you know, I'm sort of creating a, let's see, I'm missing something here, creating a, a diptych or binary where one really didn't actually exist originally. But, you know, I think William Blake, of all people, would, could appreciate that, I think. That uh, certain level of disrespect for authority and the way things are supposed to be done, etc., as we will see here momentarily. Okay. That looks good. Let's keep that. Okay. Let's move on to our next step. Oh, there's Temperus says, What's up from Beijing? Lolly says, Hi, everyone. Lisa says, Happy holidays to you. Thank you, guys. Okay, next step is our imprimatur. That's where we stain the canvas with a little bit of color. And uh, I love doing this. You don't have to do this. But I think it's... Um, um, it's, it's something that artists have been doing for 600 plus years. And... It's not quite as popular as it once was. I think probably very few people do this now, but um, I still feel very strongly about it. Whether you want to use this yellow, which is definitely my own thing and is totally different than what anybody else has ever done. Um, or maybe there's probably a few people that have done it before, but maybe in a different way. I have no idea. Um, but... I've shown, I think, over the past nearly 300 episodes that it, it works pretty well. I'm going to use my medieval torture device here to squeeze out the last little bit of paint in here. And I'll talk about what these paints are momentarily. This is great. This allows me to get the very last little bits of paint out of here. There's still lots left for the next few episodes, so... Let's start with a little blop like that, and then if I need more, I'll put more on there. Um, I think there will be, but... Uh, okay, so if you're wondering what paint I just applied onto the surface here, well, let's just talk a little bit about the palette. We're using what's called a split primary palette. That's two yellows, two reds, two blues. One of each is warm or cool, white, and you notice I didn't put black on here. Uh, I, I like to mix my own black, and I'm going to be doing that several times today. And here's your recipe. But we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there again, so, so no need to frantically try to remember that. Um, so I'm using this Amsterdam brand of paint. It's considered a student-grade paint, but it works very well for all of the paintings we've done before. Um, 
and I've just squeezed this azo yellow deep here for my input amatura. If you're wondering what that is, now you don't need to use that brand. You could use Golden, Liquitex, Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Fevacryl, Nova Color, Chroma Color, but not Museum Color because they put too much titanium white into the paint, which makes it impossible to mix a gray. Yes, other brands of paint also put white in there, but not nearly as much as the Museum Color, so mm -mm, sorry Museum Color, don't like that. So here what I'm going to do is I put my paint here, I'm going to use just a little bit of water to dilute, well to slightly dilute it, make it a little bit more uh, watery so that the it really absorbs fully and completely into the plaster gesso surface this white surface that we're painting on is is a material called gesso which is basically clear acrylic paint with plaster powder and plaster absorbs water very well so this is just going to help ensure we get into the weave of the canvas if whatever's left of it after putting gesso on there is uh, well covered. I love this step. I, this is one of my favorite steps. Uh, it really just feels like it just helps me really get into the mode of painting very quickly. I don't have that scary blank white canvas laughing at me and taunting me. You know, like, what are you going to do next, Michael? Oh, don't know what to do next. Hey, big guy. Well, too bad. It's hard to deal with a blank white canvas, isn't it? And then you just put this yellow or, or traditionally would be a, a warm brown, uh, a reddish, you know, a rusty red color, earthy tone. Um, and it just, boom, that whole, you know, problem of dealing with the blank white canvas just goes away. And within seconds, the whole painting has been covered with a color. And now it's just a matter of modifying this color. I think it also just gives a painting a real professional quality. It makes even the simple painting done over top of it have just some extra layer of, of complexity of color that is mixing optically in the viewer's mind. And if you're a beginner painter, having just something like this that can instantly elevate your painting and give it a bit more of that professional quality, I think is, is awesome. Now, again, you don't have to use this yellow I've seen artists use fluorescent pink or purple, green, blue, and you're welcome to experiment with different colors. Some of the earlier series, the, the very first series of paintings, we did a Hilma Af Klimt painting, and we divided it into four, and I, I, I applied it a few different colors as in Prematura, just so you could see how that would influence the painting. And that might have been the first time I used this yellow like that. And I think I might have just been like, oh, that's interesting. It's, uh, I kind of did it maybe as a bit of a, not a joke, but just like, oh, you could do anything. Let's put yellow here. And I'm like, oh, it kind of comes out just like the brown. I mean, not exactly, but 80% of the brown and saves me having to mix that paint. Okay. Uh, JJ says, what does layering mean? Uh, layering means putting um, different coats of paint on top of one another, different layers of paint. Um, so that, you know, we started with that white canvas, now we've got a name Prematura, which in this case is yellow. And then all the other colors that go over top of that are going to maintain a little bit of this color. It's going to come through. You know, it's... Um, as opposed to, um, you know, some artists make paintings where everything, they paint each individual little piece like a puzzle piece. 
different little sections interlocking together, which is not too dissimilar from fresco painting, the way that, let's say, the Sistine Chapel was painted, or the great murals by Diego Rivera. Uh, using th that method, you're, you are sort of painting small little bits and trying to bring them as close as possible to completion e each time because you're painting onto wet plaster. Um, so... I, what I like about layering paint like that is, you know, I, I've said it's like the, it's, it's like, I always use food analogies. You know, if this was like, um, you could think of this like we're making pizza. And, you know, if you go and buy a slice of pizza, well, you you see cheese on the top, maybe some veggies and pepperoni, but maybe you don't see the tomato sauce. Maybe you don't see the, the bread underneath, right, the dough. You just see the cheese. But, of course, when you bite into it, well, you taste everything that you maybe can't see. And that's similar to the way a painting works, is that we might not... S this yellow may or may not be entirely visible by the time the painting is done, but it's still there. And it's still, you know, maybe unconsciously influencing us. Um, because different colors, different imprimatura might elicit different feelings in the viewer, right? Like if I painted this like a like a crimson red, then that might give some sort of maybe slightly menacing feeling, kind of a, a darker energy emanating through here, um, as we did with um, Yoshito Yoshitomo Nara painting of that little girl, I don't know, probably two years ago, um, and, and what Nara did, a, a great contemporary living Japanese artist did, is he, he painted a fluorescent pink underpainting, or uh, in Primatura, and then painted this little kind of manga girl over top of it, which at first is like, oh, that's a very fun, silly painting. But his paintings, there's always this kind of little menacing aspect to it. So you kind of look at it like, it's a pretty girl, but little girl, but there's something disquieting about it. It's like what is what's what is what am, what's going on here and and you may not even really know why but it's that color that layering effect which is um uh is playing this sort of subconscious role that might question complicate the final image jay says oh the pizza example has really helped <laughs> great i'm glad yeah, any questions, let me know. That's what I'm here for, right? So let's go to our next step. We'll let this dry, and we'll talk about today's artist. Okay, so William Blake. Let's jump into here. Again, on the previous episode where we looked at William Blake's version of the crucifixion, we talked about really the first 25 years of his life, so we're just sort of going to pick up where we left off. Um, just again, William Blake, born in 1757, dies in 1827 at age 69, and um, is generally considered to be, if not one of the, the greatest British artists of all time, literally the greatest British artist of all time. Um, certainly one of the most influential, most controversial, most um, uh, inspiring artists of, of all time. If you're someone who is an iconoclast, an anti-authoritarian, um, uh, you, you, you are always seem to be kind of railing against the system, William Blake should be your hero. William Blake is, you know, like a, um, he's a, he's a proto-feminist. He's a, um, uh, he's, you know, he, he was one of an early, he, you know, uh, he was one of the first, not one of the first, but an early pers er, early questioner of the slave trade and what was half happening to African Americans in Africa as well as, as North America, uh, as we'll see here. So, you know, he was, he's uh, one of those guys that I think um, 
we can look back in history and say, you know, he was a pretty good guy in most respects. Whereas, you know, there's some, we look back at some other historical figures and you're like, yeah, I did some good things, but yikes, uh, it was on the wrong side of a few major issues, like slavery, for instance. You know, when we think of many great um, North American leaders, like um, uh, George Washington, for instance, who had slaves, or you look at Sir Johnny MacDonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, who uh, said paraphrasing basically the goal should be to get rid of all of the First Nations people here in Canada or Aboriginal people um, besides doing great things had some you know um, questionable to say the least opinions on uh, people that did not look like them right including women as well I'm not saying George Washington or 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 Johnny McDonald had um, negative views on women. I, I maybe they did. <laughs> Wouldn't have surprised me just the era they were living in, but uh, uh, it just wasn't. It, that was more common back in the day. Totally off track, Michael. Let's get back on track here. <laughs> Um, so we kind of ended here just sort of talking about his experience at the Royal Academy. So William Blake goes to the Royal Academy to study. After he's been working since he was like 10 years old uh, in an, as an apprentice for an engraver, uh, he attends the Royal Academy, who's present at the time, Sir Joshua Reynolds. And it was, you know, we talked about this briefly last class. Uh, I did do a whole bunch more research over the last few days because I was... I was thinking to myself, what is it about, like, what, 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 why was the conflict so raw for William Blake? Why did he despise Joshua Reynolds so much? And there is quite a lot of literature about this. Um, and to be honest, it's, uh, it's kind of confusing because, you know, if we look back from our perspective today, Joshua Reynolds and William Blake, you know, don't seem to be necessarily that different. Um, they're both painting, at, you know, they're both alive at the same time, Joshua Reynolds being older, obviously. Uh, but, um, you know, they're, they both were fascinated by art of antiquity, like the, the great Greek and Roman sculptures and um, tile relief paintings, etc. And both held that as the ideal that an artist should aspire to. They also both were great admirers of Renaissance artists like Raphael and Michelangelo, Leonardo. And... Um, but that's sort of where it ends. Both, so both of them had this kind of classical education, both fascinated with history and saw that that was kind of the goal of, 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 of artists. But whereas uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds kind of aspired to the, the highest heights of, of English society, and eventually became the uh, the official painter to King uh, Henry the Third, I think. Um, so that he was literally the official court painter. Although it's, a, it's interesting that once Re Reynolds was, you know, he was sort of like next in line for that job, but when uh, when it came up, there was some dispute as maybe it would be William Gainsborough. And Joshua Reynolds really fought and was quite angry that somebody else could take that position because he thought he was sort of naturally in line for it. And then once he got the position, he realized basically the king paid about a quarter as much as everybody else paid. So he was he ended up sort of he, he Joshua Reynolds thought it sort of stepped down from where he was prior to that. Um, but Joshua Reynolds was sort of seen as you know like your like almost like a politician, like like a a very like a, a guy who is loved by all, really even tempered, uh, not really like very careful with his words, um, 
you know, people, not that many people had a bad thing to say about him when they met him. And William Blake is sort of like the opposite kind of character. He's the kind of person that, you know, is says what he's thinking, doesn't really care what people think about him, and uh, and really sort of despised that kind of schmarmy political um, uh, social climber kind of personality that that he believed Joshua Reynolds to be. Um, they also, you know, both again, both of them really believed that looking back to the past was really important um, and that one should strive to paint idealized images of of um, like these platonic forms like like Plato the the Greek philosopher talks about sort of that there's a world beyond what is seen and that be beyond the the, the world of surfaces there are these platonic forms these idealized shapes and that most of us just see all the artifice around us but we want to strip that away and get to the real get to the truth um, but William Blake just saw like what uh, Joshua Reynolds is doing as um, really being what he would consider like a slave to nature painting exactly uh, what he saw and really not using his imagination or his um, or a, a deep sense of search for the truth, right? He just sees Joshua Reynolds as sort of making pretty pictures for rich people and just doing whatever he can to please them rather than, than being this like pseudo scientist, you know, adventurer, explorer into the truth. So, um, uh, which is interesting because, you know, William Blake's images, I, I guess you wouldn't really, if you look at any of the artwork by William Blake, I don't think the first thing anyone thinks of is like, wow, that looks, you know, that looks like something I've seen before. I, I you know, that's a place that I could travel to. There, that's a landscape that I recognize. You know, basically, like every image of William Blake who we're looking at right here, you look at it and you're like, these are all uh, totally from someone's imagination. Uh, these are, uh, you know, out of the, the mind of a madman, as many people back in the day said. That was, you know, a very common thing to people would just be like, William Blake, that guy is. He is off his rocker. Um, so, but William Blake here believes that what he's illustrating is not the world of appearances, uh, but the world that exists beneath it, that, that only someone with true, deep insight and dedication to the truth can observe. Right? So, um, you know, it, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me William Blake, I don't know if this is going, the, what comes to mind is, you know, uh, um, I just imagine if, let's say, COVID happened during this time, I'm sure there were plagues and stuff all the time back in the day, William Blake seems to me the kind of person who would be standing on the street corner saying, uh, you know, vaccines are, you know, it's all a lie and all that kind of stuff that you guys don't really know what's really going on. I've seen the truth. I've done my own research, that kind of thing. Like, um, and I'm a huge William Blake fan. Um, and I'm also somebody who's been vaccinated and all that. So I totally believe in all that. Uh, but um, William Blake, I could see being a kind of conspiracy theorist, the kind of person that that thinks everybody else has been hoodwinked and he really he's the one guy that knows what's really going on i could be totally wrong i'm sure there's if some uh <laughs> uh uh william blake scholar were to watch this and be like that what on earth is that guy thinking but that's just you know that's the the, the i guess the attitude that i imagine william blake having is somebody who is 
and it is just really super stubborn about his own vision. He, he was sort of considered to be a quote-unquote visionary poet, visionary artist who is going to explore and do whatever he wants to do and does not care what anybody else thinks or believes. He's pretty sure he's on the right track. And he doesn't, he's, I'm sure, upset about the progress of his own career, but he's, um, he's sort of resigned to the fact that, it, that, uh, you know, he has to do what he has to do. So let's just sort of move on here. So around age 24, 25, he gets married to Catherine Boucher. And, um, there's some question of whether they may or may not have had a child. If they did, it was likely um, born, stillborn, because there is um, some mention of something like that uh, happening at the end of one of his stories. So there's the suggestion that maybe he's incorporating some aspect of his biography into uh, that story. Um... Let's see. But, you know, it's the, the woman... So Catherine was illiterate when she... Uh, up until the time that they met, she literally signed the marriage certificate with an X. And William Blake taught her how to read and write as well as how to do etchings like himself. And they collaborated on many works together. And they... There's, there's also disagreement as to like how happy that marriage was. Some people said that the, it wasn't particularly happy, and then there's, there's some people saying there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, but she was there all the way until the day he died at his deathbed, and after William Blake died, she, um, I don't, I don't know what the she, she basically refused to do any doesn't like sell any of his works until she consulted with him which you know I don't know if that you know meant talking to a psychic I don't know if psychics were a thing at this time at the early you know around 1830 I know that becomes more important later on especially in English culture um, you know you have people like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, who you know the author of of uh, of uh, Sherlock Holmes, who is who's becomes deeply fascinated with with psychics and the ability to talk to the dead. Well, same sort of thing with William Blake's wife. She um, believes that she's can see the spirit of William of her husband, and she talks to him, and they d discuss what to do with the prince after he dies. Um, but, you know, that's also not surprising. I mean, it, it, that's not surprising because that's something William Blake was convinced that he was able to see Christ and, and the apostles and uh, that he was able to talk to dead people throughout history and, um, and that that's, you know, that those experiences are incorporated into many of his, his books. So he probably, you know... Um, whether Catherine had those those thoughts before they married, or or that's something that she gathered through spending lots lots of time with him, is I, I have no idea. Um. So again, in his mid twenties, he also takes on um, he begins working with this a radical uh, kind of anarchist publisher, Joseph Johnson, who is you know is publishing these kind of anti-government pamphlets and um, and a number of other well-known people are gathering at his house and having these, you know, like a salon, these conversations about philosophy and life and art, etc. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because also William Blake's parents were considered to be English dissenters people that were opposed to the English uh, church um, switching from Catholicism to Protestantism. And he literally was buried in what was called the Dissenters Cemetery, so was not allowed to be buried with um, you know, proper Christians. Um, and 
So, you know, all the way going back to William Blake's earliest upbringing, you know, I'm sure there were fiery conversations in the house and potentially, you know, interactions in the street walking around with his father where, you know, probably some people wouldn't even look at his father, you know. So you can imagine from that early age, he's, he's, he's pretty used to being a nonconformist, right? Uh... Ch -ch -ch -ch. The other thing too, you know, so, you know, in the late 1700s, you have revolutions in France and in the United States. And William Blake is, he's all for that. He's like, wow, we're going to tear down the monarchy. We're going to get rid of this, this stale old tradition. We're going to be like France and America, and we're going to have proper republics. And so he's kind of outwardly campaigning for that kind of thing. Of course, again, and that is exactly the opposite of Joshua Reynolds, who makes it his point to try to uh, win favors with the, the most elite until he literally becomes the private painter of the king, right? So you, I mean, right there, you're, you're basically on two sides of the coin, right? Um, and... Um, also... You know, as part of that group of, of revolutionaries who are meeting um, at the, the house of the printer that he's now working with is Mary Wollstonecraft, who is the mother of Mary Shelley, who writes famously Frankenstein, um, and, uh, you know, is a revolutionary herself, you know, and a kind of proto-feminist. And, you know, he illustrates, William Blake illustrates part one of her books and you know that that one of the things that they're advocating for is total equality between men and women and that women don't need to get married in order to walk around outside or to go to school or do have a you know have money of their own all these things that we take for granted today but you know back in the late 1700s early 1800s having that type of opinion on on equality between men and women was pretty radical i mean just think it took another 150 years for the western world to come around on that issue right so uh, william blake you know he another thing william blake you know is is really a fervent believer in is this idea of free love i don't know if it's necessarily the way that hippies would have thought of that in the 1960s but this, I, but it, again, this idea that that even like the institution of marriage is maybe a little bit um, out of date. There is some speculation that maybe William Blake uh, tried to introduce a third person into his marriage with Catherine. There's no, I mean, there's that's that. It's also a debate whether some information like that that's come down through history was is actual fact or just things that that William Blake's critics you know drummed up to uh, ridicule or humiliate or discredit him right um, so we also have here you know illustrations where he's talking about the slave trade and how it's um, uh, impacting England and that it's a, a great shame of the country you know I mean that is also a relatively uncommon opinion back in the day Although it's growing, there's definitely uh, a whole movement in, of anti-slavery amongst white people in England and the United States um, that is, is, is building steam, obviously. Um, and, you know, it's not and only another 50 years or so before there's the uh, American Revolution, which we can debate what, what the the cause of that is, but, you know, obviously a major cause was, was slavery in the southern states. Um, so there's a, a kind of a moving around towards the end of his life. He moves back and forth to a few different places. Uh, and there's, you know, William Blake being a, um, uh, a an iconoclast finds it hard to sell his work his reputation sort of precedes him 
and so he sort of depends on a few people like very like-minded wealthier people to buy his work and not and and often some of the people that are buying his work are buying it not necessarily because they really like his work but they really believe in him and his ideals and are good friends with him so there is sort of a um, uh, there is that which I, you know who knows how much William Blake knew of that and you know it, or if he was like well I know these people don't like my work but I don't it's hard to turn down money and they are good friends of mine but I know they're probably never going to hang my stuff up in their house I'm sure they think I'm a loony but I kind of got to feed the wife and put the roof over our head here um so there is that there's again I'm, I'm sure you know he's having to make some compromises in terms of his career um we talked about his difficulty you know he's using for the most part for his own artwork a very kind of complex and outdated system of printmaking that requires him to hand paint almost everything and takes a long time is expensive and ultimately is one of the causes of him not being able to to spread his work out as far as he liked although he, he was using more traditional more more popular dominant etching methods for his more commercial work which he did he also besides um, making his his more idiosyncratic and more personal visionary poems like we did we looked at last class in Jerusalem uh, which was this was a long uh, poem that is you know re is you know, I, I mean I, I couldn't I still don't re can't really wrap my head around the thousands of characters in that book and what it's ultimately all about um, but um, so he did that kind of thing but he also did you know il he did a lot of biblical illustrations particularly towards the end of his life because those were quite popular and um, maybe had less baggage right like for instance the, the art we're going to do today this image of Jesus or Christ um, um, his resurrection and emerging from the tomb and um, kind of presenting himself to his disciples those this type of image was a much easier sell than let's say the painting we did last class which is wherever I put it you know is is not it's not really there's nothing like this in the Bible for instance so while people are gonna be like oh that looks like the crucifixion but Sorry, which uh, which Bible verse does does this illustrate? And William Blake, well, oh, it's actually not part of the Bible. This is part of my own book. Here, would you like to buy a copy? You're like, oh, that's uh, okay, interesting. Whereas this painting is is maybe a little bit more on the traditional end of things. Um, Heidi says, Happy Easter, Michael and everyone, and says, quote, A woman must have money and a room of her own if she's to write fiction, um, said Virginia Woolf. Absolutely, right? So um, without that love, that ability to support, to, to be independent, to be able to support themselves, uh, you're, you're always... Um, uh, you never have that that freedom that's necessary to express yourself completely um, so you know as we let me see I just want to scroll, get going here the the last thing that that um, William Blake is working on at the time of his death are the illustrations for Dante's divine in um, inferno and is it no divine is it divine comedy right it's divine yeah divine comedy and so here's some of the, the this is like literally one of the final things he's, i think there were seven of these that he produced before he died obviously there would probably have been a hundred of these illustrations um but i think there is there sort of kind of a lovely description um of of Catherine sitting next to him when he dies here 
Um, so he died on August 12th, 1827, and it said kind of the the night that he died, he was he was working feverishly in bed, and and turns to his wife and says, "Stay, Kate. Keep just as you are. I will draw your portrait, for you have ever been an angel to me." And then he drew her picture, um, sang a hymn, and died during the night while she held his hand. Right, and, and a, a female lodger who is staying at the house at that time says, I have been at the death not of a man, but of a blessed angel. Right, which is uh, maybe apocryphal. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if, if that was necessarily... I mean, I don't know how many people consider William Blake an angel. Probably some people would have considered him to be, you know, a, a lunatic. <laughs> But maybe if you got to know him, you probably would have really thought he was a sweet guy. I have no idea. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let me see. Is there some things I wanted to mention here? Oh, you know, one thing I, I did just want to correct a little mistake from last week's class is I, I did mention that this poem here um, and did those feet in ancient time this is the prefer this this poem is called Jerusalem but it's actually not in the book Jerusalem this is from the this is the preface to another William Blake poem called Milton a poet I think or is it Milton the poet I think it's called that uh, he wrote which is also this w was was later turned into a hymn and I did not I had I did not know this but what is kind of let's see um it's by some people consider this to be like an un the an unofficial uh, a second national anthem for England or Britain, uh, and I, I had never, I've never heard of this before. The the hymn as it's sung, but I was watching a couple videos. One was a recording at the Royal Albert Al, the bleh. one was a recording at the Royal Albert Hall of of um, you know thousands of people singing these verses and waving the the. What is the British flag? The Un Union Jack, right? The un why do waving the Union Jack around. Some, for some reason, that sounds wrong, but waving it around and singing with like great pride, and you're like, that is so interesting. I mean, any of those of you from England watching, I'd be so interested to hear. Like, do people sing that anthem in school or church or? Like, how is it that, that this William Blake poem, which was, you know, um, kind of set to music later on during World War One, how is it that that poem is, is such a familiar poem to English people? I mean, essentially, this poem, Jerusalem, sort of suggests the possibility there's this, there's a uh, largely disputed and dismissed um idea that Christ either before he was crucified or after he rose from the dead um, spent time in England and visited England and um, was there to help spread the message and establish you know heaven paradise Jerusalem um, on the British Isle Isles and so that's kind of what this that, that England is is this is or the one should strive to create heaven in England. I, again, I'm super. I'd be super fascinated to hear what the uh, what people have to say about that. Anyway, I just wanted to correct that because I did. I think I mentioned that this was the preface to Jerusalem, the epic poem. No, this is the, <laughs> this is the poem Jerusalem that was part that which was the preface to a different poem called Milton. <laughs> if that's and I think probably that kind of confusion that we see um, 
right there is 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 very typical of William Blake, and almost to to the point where I I kind of feel like uh, it's deliberate on William Blake's part, like he really kind of cultivates confusion that he relishes in that murkiness uh, that that uh, clarity wasn't his goal although pro I, maybe that last thing would be very controversial to, to uh, Blake's scholar I don't know I, I, I don't know anyway let's move on let's let's make this painting so Do we want to do an underpainting? Is it necessary? I was thinking, you know, the painting we made last time, perhaps um, one thing that I, w I did not like so much was how um, big these outlines were. Well, you know, it's not so bad. I guess my, my, my thinking here is that maybe... Oops. Maybe what I could do is do my... Do an underpainting, outline everything, and then paint over top of it, and sort of try to leave a little bit of those black lines visible as if they're kind of the pen lines or from the original lines from the etching. Because remember, this is an etched image. It's a print that then William Blake hand-colored with watercolor paint and ink. So he's trying to be careful not to obliterate all of his, his lines from the print. So... But I... I don't mind how this turned out. And I have a feeling even if I did all of that work now, I might have to do go back and go over a bunch of those lines. And is that just a bunch of busy work I'd be making for myself? I think so. Okay. So I think what I'm going to do next is... Paint a layer of of uh, cool. Well, that yellow is very cool. Even his body. What I'm trying to think is, I want to create this very muted background which has a lot of white so let's take okay so here's my this is matte medium here so matte medium, which is just clear paint. There's no... There's no pigment in there. So let's take a bunch of that. Let's take some yellow and white. So and this is my cool yellow and white. I'm mixing it into the matte medium, which is going to dilute it. Now I wonder, do I want to cover? I could paint the whole body. Could paint, should I do the whole image? That would save me time. And then I'll go over this with a warmer, or should I just go around? Let's. You know what? Let's go over the entire body.
Let's go over the entire image. Amy. So I have to do this kind of quickly because matte medium doesn't have a slow dry property to it. So it's already starting to kind of seize up a little bit. Not super even, but we're, you know, we're going to be painting, darkening a bunch of areas anyway. I could do another coat. Let's, uh, I'm going to blow dry that. I to think to myself. Okay, I think that's good. I mean, do I need to, is there any areas that need to be kind of touched up? I think that's that's good. It, it is kind of, care, it, you gotta be careful because if I start putting paint over little areas where it's a little bit patchy, I could end up making them more white and end up sort of creating the inverse problem where maybe something that was a little bit too transparent is now too opaque so I'm just doing what I'm suggesting maybe you don't do uh, just to kind of fill in any kind of little gaps a little bit of yellow coming off my brush there So that, that, you know, I could have, I was thinking about just painting around the figure and, and but then it's like, well, you know what, I'm probably going to be painting a, a warmer 
yellow over top and to kind of clean this up later on anyway so this is just much faster just to paint it all in ojo says hi sensei <laughs> i believe jesus is lord says hello everyone happy resurrection day happy easter to you as well Okay, so now what I want to do, I'm going to mix a, um, a, a basically a black, and I'm going to start putting that into the background here. So for those of you that haven't done this before, we'll go through it together. Let's take some yellow. There's a little bit of white in there, which is not great, but I think there's a lot in there, so we'll be fine, I think. And then we're going to take, so we've got cool yellow, cool blue, and warm red. We mix these guys together, and if we've got an equal amount of each one, we'll get a black. You know, I look here, and it's like, oh, it doesn't look very black yet. It looks kind of more on the green area of things. Well, what does that mean if it's green? What does that tell us? Well, if it's a little bit on the green side, we get green by yellow and blue. So that means we don't have enough red. So let's add a bit more red in there to balance that out. And by putting red in there, it's going to drag the green into the neutral core. That's pretty close. I still think we can get a little bit more red in here. Now, if anything, you know, this has almost got a bit of a brownish quality back here. So you know what I might do? Before I even use this, I think I'm going to take this color just on my brush. I'm going to take my red. I'm going to make a bit of a, a cold brown. So I'm going to take my cool red. Remember I said maybe I'm not going to use this? Well, here I am. I've got some of my cool red, cool yellow. And because I have this black on here, it's going kind of brown. But we'll take even a little bit more blue. And mix this together. Now that's a bit more on the brown side, so I'm just going to dilute it with a bit more black and get something that's a very, very more muted brown. In fact, let's just keep taking a bit more black. Do I have more matte medium? Yeah, I got a little bit. <laughs> Forgot. I thought, okay, I knew I had some. How much of it I had? Uh, okay.
so I wonder how much this cost me. Uh, and you know what? Before I pour it, let's just give it a good little shake. Make sure the lids... Oh, and I should have shaken that up before I... try to be creative and think about how I can get this into this. Uh, I could use some paper, cardstock, cardboard, a little spoon. Uh, I'm just going to mute my microphone so I can go... I do have a funnel. I knew I had a funnel, but it's one of those things that says, where is the funnel? Now, this is the kind of thing where you need another hand to do this. So, do I have an empty mug? I know this is a, a major diversion from, from the class, but... Uh... Where's my spatula? I have a spatula somewhere here. I have a little spatula that I use to... But I can't find it, so... I can utilize this afterwards. I'll put that. Will it stand on my palette? Okay. Okay, 
So there's that. Okay. Let's... Yeah. It was just a matter of time, wasn't it? Okay, I'm just going to put this in the sink. Okay, thanks for indulging me here. So let's mix in matte medium into this brown. So what it's gonna do is make this more transparent. Oh, how about even, let's, uh, I guess this should be background layer number one, right? I didn't, I don't think I made a title for this. Come on, Michael, I can't get a straight line with my paintbrush here. Forgot. Let's 
so I'm just these uh, stones in the arch here. How many blocks do I put in? Let's. Hmm, hmm. Where's my outline? Okay, it's right under there. that be that's not right Is that right? Well, we'll see here momentarily. Now I know this is not particularly visible in William Blake's original artwork there. But it was something that I felt I wanted to put a bit of that structure of the architecture in, in this place. Um, another thing to keep in mind is the reds oops, of... Uh, on camera, I've deliberately boosted them to, so that this probably looks a little bit more 
reddish brown on camera than it actually is in person. It's just a byproduct of the color temperature that I set the camera at, the white balance, etc. Sandra says, Hi friends, was watching and folding laundry and now I'm getting ready to finally sit in my studio. Awesome. Nice to see you, Sandra. I think I'm going to kind of approach it the way I did last episode in that I'm going to paint over top of these lines Now, in retrospect, I probably should have just done all of the, the lines radiating all the way out, all at the same time. But, you know, each painting is just is full of shoulda, woulda, coulda's, right? Each time I make a painting, it's like, ah, I realized halfway through there was a different way of doing it. And 
or maybe even sometimes it's not even until you're done, you're like, oh, you know what? I would have saved myself so much time if I did X, Y. But, you know, sometimes you just never know until you do it. And the, the only other option would be to then to just sit around and try to outwit the painting before you've even started it and try to figure out the best method and you just would end up spending all your time thinking about how you're gonna do it and then what happens is you get so kind of afraid and overwhelmed with how you would do it that you just don't do it at all because you're afraid of making a mistake and that's the great tragedy, is that there's so many people out there who never begin their masterpiece because they're waiting t until they get enough skills or education or, you know, just waiting for the right time. And those, there's never going to be a right time. There's always going to be, you're never going to have everything in the right place. So you just got to take that leap, go and do it. And in doing it, you'll come up with solutions. It's never too late because there's always another painting waiting to be made. So there's probably going to, I'm going to narrow some of these beams as we go. Um, but I'm starting them kind of wider because it's always easier to thicken them. Or, or make the space in between them thinner, whichever way you want to think about it than it is to uh, go the opposite way. Because that involves, you know, getting the white out and painting that on top of it, which I'll probably still do anyway, but the less of that I have to do, I think the better.
So these um, radiating beams are not all equidistant, nice and evenly spread out. Um, just because I didn't bother, you know, measuring them. I know there's tools in Photoshop that would help me do that. But, kind of like William Blake, it didn't... I almost feel like if I had done it too well, it would look too artificial. And that would run completely counter to William Blake's whole ethos of... At least I think so, right? I think he would not appreciate that. I think he would prefer the the more the rougher approach, I think. Or would he say that that's that's interesting to. That's the initial layer. Um, I'm just going to take this same paint. See how it's just naturally darker because I'm putting a second coat of paint on top of this and it's a little bit transparent, right? The paint's transparent so every layer I put on here is building up and making it darker. These radiating beams aren't all that straight. Again, that's okay.
overall this effect depending on how we go about it can be very very subtle and almost invisible or we can make this very very um, central to the painting and I think as we paint it that will become clearer and clearer to to me hopefully As we, we're going to darken all of this again in successive layers, so yeah, this will get less and less apparent, perhaps, depending on how I go about the subsequent layers. So if after you go th through a few, after you do this, you might go like, ah, I don't like how I did it, or all these lines are all wonky, well, then just paint them out. No problem. I'm happy with that. Okay, so let's blow dry all this to get it nice and, and solid there.
Okay, so now I'm going to switch to my black. And I'm going to kind of just repeat this. So let's take the black and mix it in with some of the matte medium. So I'm going to go right over top of the divisions on the between the stones. So these are getting fairly well defined. That's okay.
So maybe I could have done this first. That way I could have been really ensured that my beams would be relatively straight and coherent. But I didn't. And that's okay. It makes me think of like Bob Ross, how Bob Ross would do a test painting and then he would do the painting on camera and then he'd do another painting afterwards that would be the one that they would use uh, to promote the show and that one would be, you know, if you buy a an umbrella with a Dob, Dob Bross, Bob Ross painting on it. It's it's that third painting. So when you see Bob Ross painting on TV, just keep in mind he's he's done a version, at least one version already. He's already had a, a bit of an opportunity to practice and get down exactly how he wants to. Uh, to proceed and he can kind of work out any mistakes or any problems and I, it wouldn't surprise me if he had the that first one just off of camera so that he can look at it and think to himself okay what worked the first time what didn't work that first time what do I want to change what do I want to do differently this next opportunity so in a perfect world if I was doing this on a larger scale for TV and if there were if I was getting paid a living wage to do it I would probably do it next I would I would do a version before going on camera so that I would look really smart and prepared and I'd have a lot more confidence that whenever I made a decision that it was the right decision and not just a educated guess Just out of curiosity, how are these two unfolding side by side? They definitely have a similar sort of quality, right? This here on the right being one from uh, Good Friday for the crucifixion, and the left there is today's painting, the Resurrection. Let's blow dry that.
Now what I think I'm gonna do is take my matte medium. Blow dry that.
Now I'm going to do a reverse glaze and lighten up around the head in particular. That's okay. Or do I want to do another layer? Do I want to get even darker? Maybe, maybe I, I need to see what the rest of the painting looks like before I get darker. Because I, th I might want to even darken this more and make this even bring more attention. It's also slightly uneven here. So I'm going to blow dry that once more. You know, and I, I just remember, or not remembering, just thinking about, um, I kind of missed this, there's that lighter area around the arch, so I do want to, let's mix some more black. It's a little bit on the brown side. Just tells me I need more blue. There we go.
gonna do here?
so that is pretty dark. Like now, some of the definition between those bricks back there are, it's very subtle. Maybe too subtle, some would say, but. Okay, so let's blow dry that and then I think we're ready to move on. bits of dried paint on my fingertips there. Okay, so what I want to do now is I'm going to use some glazing fluid. Which is like matte medium, right? This is matte medium, and this is matte glazing fluid, or satin glazing fluid, if you will. The difference between these are they both dry totally clear, and you can use them almost interchangeably. The difference is that the satin glazing fluid has a slow dry chemical in there that keeps the paint from drying as quickly. So um, it allows us to do some more precise blending of paint. And so what I want to do now is uh, let's take some white basically we're gonna do what we did earlier take some white and yellow mix these together Okay. Now we're going to go back 
in the opposite direction. You want to make sure you're um, the paint is sufficiently dried underneath so that if I do any blending I uh, I I'm not going to wipe away the previous surface here. Maybe let's zoom in now for the first time. Maybe that's too close. So you know, I actually feel like I'm going to add more yellow into this mixture. Let that dry, move on.
this uh, mixture is a little bit more opaque than I was hoping it would be. You know, some of those lines are turning out better than others, and that's okay. Just keep moving. Ay, ay, ay. I think part of it is this brush it's starting to get inundated with paint. So I'll just go to the other side and just let that dry.
still wet down there. So I'll just come back up to the top and just catch up here. Okay, let's uh, back it out and just sort of see how things look. Hmm, you know, it's a little uneven, but again, I can also go back the other way and darken that as well. Now I wanna just focus a little bit tighter into this area. In fact, actually, you know, I should blow dry all that.
So I'm, tr I'm trying to kind of take care of that rough edge there.
not my best fade, or at least one of the slower iterations of this starburst. So I just keep on going around and around and around, bringing more and more opacity towards the body. Let's blow dry this here.
again, you know, this is a painting, you know, there's lots of emotions going on inside me as I'm working on it that, you know, like alternately feeling like, okay, it's looking great. And then, oh no, oh my goodness, I'm going to be here all day. Should I stop? Should I just give up on this thing? How much longer do I want to put into it? And I think it's it's coming back to life. You know, even just over the past few minutes, there's been like, oh, is this a goner? Should I just stop and start it again? But then the the voice in me says, well, we could certainly stop. There's no nothing wrong with that. And um and then but what if we were to continue and we were to to make it work even after it felt like all was lost and i'll tell you like in my experience the paintings that i've made where i was convinced it was it was just trash and yet i just kept going and when I was able to, to make it work, ultimately, whew, that is like the most rewarding feeling ever. And if you've never had that feeling yet, it just means you haven't been painting long enough. Because eventually, or maybe you just be, you're giving up too quickly on things. You know, it's like making a a dinner or something and if you've got like the, all the relatives coming over or you got friends over date or something and you're making your special meal and it's like oh no what did i do i cooked it too long oh my goodness it's all disaster okay well everyone's gonna be here in 10 minutes what do i do what do i do uh, well i don't unless Unless I just want to call everybody and tell them to cancel and not to come. How can I pull this one out of the depths of despair and make it work? And if you've ever been in that situation and you've just... You had no choice but to try to figure a way to make it work and you ultimately did make it work... You probably know what that feeling is like, of like, whoa, here I thought dinner was going to be a disaster, and everyone's saying how much they love it, and, wow, maybe I'm not such a bad cook after all, kind of. I'm going to blow dry that again and just keep on.
Okay, I'm getting a bit impatient here. I'm just going right into it with some uh, white with maybe very small amount of glazing fluid just to, because this is just enough, 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 enough of this. Let's just, I want to finish this background. And Yikes. <clears throat> Okay, again, uh, kind, of, kind of different than the original, to say the least. Um, hmm. Uh, Jacob says, hey, Michael, I just found your channel and started your beginner drawing course last week. Thank you for making it. I really enjoy it. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob, for saying so. Um, that's awesome. I love that that course is just keeps going. More and more people are taking it and getting more and more confident with their drawing. And then after that, moving into to painting. So 
So now that that's kind of white, I am contemplating adding cool yellow on the outer parts of these radiating beams. Um, because what that's going to do is make this center part seem really hot, like, or not hot, like really bright. The closer it gets to white, the brighter the explosion of color would be. In fact, if I just keep on, maybe I should do a little bit of white fringe just right around the edge here. That's just going to make him just glow with brightness. You know, this uh, reminds me doing this type of thing. Um, we did a Mickey Mouse painting a long time ago. And I did something very similar. And that, that turned out really well. Um, Three steps forward, one step back, ain't it the case sometimes? Let 
that dry, Michael. Yikes. Ah. Where's Paula? Paula would usually be telling me to move on from the background at this point already, right? But Michael, we've been working on the background for three hours. Let's just move on.
Okay. That's good. I want to do a bit of yellow now. I know this is just taking forever, but... Uh, there is Paula. Paula says, uh, I'm here. Take it easy. Thanks, Michael. I was doing some cleaning in my kitchen. The mice ran across my counters. I don't cry, though. Nikki says, hi, everyone. Good evening. Hope you all had a blessed great Easter today. And Paula says, since we put up a few ultrasound uh, lights in the basement, it might prevent more mice from coming in. Good luck with that. Good luck. Once... You know, dealing with mice is just a nightmare, isn't it? Okay. Um, I am gonna. I want to move on from this background here shortly. Obviously, it's once again totally different than the original. Um, I don't know what? Why the last couple of paintings I really got into these radiating beams? I think it's just I like the dynamic quality of them. So what I want to do is I want to take. Um, some cool yellow. And white. I don't need... Doesn't, if I, I don't want to put make it too intensely yellow. But I do want to kind of fade this out. The bit of yellow on the far edges. That's going to make this just seem like... Just, you know, like... Ah, it's so bright. I can't see. Oh my goodness. So, well, that's very subtle.
Okay, I think we're just gonna move on from this. Not it's okay. Not super happy with that, but I've been working on that background for almost four hours, so and now that I see it, I could probably could have done the exact same thing in about forty-five minutes if I wanted to get this exact look. So you know, it is what it is. Okay, let me blow dry all that. Maybe I need to switch T's. So now I want to use some warmer yellows. So far, this has been all cool colors in the background. So now I want to uh, do the opposite and get some warm colors onto his body. Let's take that white. What I want to do here is just kind of do a little bit of a cleaning up of some edges. Let that dry, Michael. Stop painting. Hey, hey, hey.
pretty quiet today, I guess, eh? The last couple paintings have been pretty focused. <laughs> They've given me a little bit of grief here, so... My brain is fully preoccupied with the matter at hand. Okay, let's just, uh, I'm going to blow dry that real quickly so I can paint over it again. Now, ideally, I'd like to be able to avoid doing an outline. Um, but that might be one of the only ways to kind of clean up some of the messier aspects of this painting. I could do a very light kind of gray outline. We'll see. Okay, I'm going to turn this towel. Here's my towel that I've been wiping my brush on for about the past year, right? Let's just flip it this way. Not quite as dirty. Maybe let's flip it upside down too. I've been meaning to do this for a long time. So this gives me an excuse to do it. I'm fed up with that dirty towel. Sometimes it make things worse.
<laughs> Nikki asks a uh, good question. Um, hey, teacher, just curious, is there any art that you're not a big fan of, like realism or expressionism or impressionism or abstract or surrealism or things like that? Hmm. Well... I'm probably not the biggest fan of text art, art that just features like words, uh, which is different than poetry, but there's there's a whole kind of genre of art that is, is sort of large words, neon letters and things. Not the biggest fan of that kind of thing. Um, I mean, it's more, it, I think it's more poetry than visual art, but there's nothing wrong with making that kind of art, just not really my, not something I'm super big fan of. I have a couple friends who make art like that. Uh, it's not really my cup of tea though. Um, I can see the use for it. There's a couple of public art installations in Vancouver that are just like like a sentence. Um, I think, I can't remember who did the, did it, it's, is it, um, Spencer or something in Vancouver. There's a big sign that says like everything is okay. Everything will be okay, I think. Um, which you know is it's now kind of an iconic part of the Vancouver uh, skyline. Um, I mean, yeah, th there's that. On the other hand, there's the East Van. The East Van Cross in Vancouver, which is text, but it's is based on an old kind of graffiti, or well, who knows? It, or it could be a gang symbol. <laughs> There's been lots of dispute about that, but uh, that is text based. But I like that. Um, I th it's super iconic. I, I love that. Um, I don't know. Is there art that I don't like? I think I just don't like lazy art, art that isn't well, con that's not considered or passionate or um, uh, it doesn't, I'm not the, also the biggest fan of art that is just purely pretty. I like art that has thought and meaning and a concept behind it that has something to say. Um, uh, but, you know, there's artworks that I think are just purely pretty, and then I start to kind of research them, and I think, like, oh, there's a lot more going on here than just a pretty, some flowers. You know, like, there's a lot of pretty paintings by Van Gogh, and I you know, read about Van Gogh, I, I read his own thoughts about those things, and thinking about, like, how deeply he thought about those paintings, and it's like, oh, there's, there's more than just a, a vase of sunflowers there. Um, and especially doing these episodes, there's, there are artists that I kind of liked that I, I fell in love with as I was getting ready for the episode that I, um, probably would not have, have been such a fan of previously had I not been doing what I'm doing today. So... You know, I think it's just like any t anything. If you, the more you learn about something, the more interesting it becomes, and the more likely you are to to um, to be less dismissive of it. Like it reminds me when I was um, in a, a past life many years ago, when I was in my late teens, I worked at a record store, a big chain in Vancouver or in Calgary called uh, Sam the Record Man, and when and I was brought in as the the sort of resident expert on punk rock music, if you can believe it, again, a long time ago. And when we first started working there, everyone had to make uh, each other a mixtape because there was a heavy metal expert, a blues mu music expert, a jazz expert, a country music expert, classical, and so on and so forth. And everyone had to make each other uh, mixtapes. And so when when I was hired in, I had to go, I had to make a mixtape and then make 
you know, 20 copies. Again, tapes. Remember tapes? And uh, and they would give me their tapes, or, or somebody who had the previous tape would pass it on so they didn't have to make a new version. Um, and that was so interesting, because there were definitely some genre of music I had zero interest, like country and heavy metal music, jazz, blues music. It's like being into punk rock, it was all that just it was like garbage. And um, after listening to these tapes that we each that were made for me, I realized like, wow, there is some amazing country music. There's amazing heavy metal music. There's amazing blues and jazz music. I got into, I'm a huge jazz fan now. Like, I would never, ever have listened to jazz music before I started working at the record store. And after that experience, I became a, I, 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 probably jazz might be amongst my top three favorite musics after maybe like rock and. Maybe, maybe it's rock and jazz I've ever thought about it. But yeah, that was like revelatory experience. And since then, it just it, it taught me that there's there is great stuff about every genre, just like in great stuff in every type of approach to painting. Of course, there's some and, and on the other hand, there are horrible examples of every type of genre, just like there's horrible types, you know, there's you could go for dinner and have like a horrible hamburger at McDonald's. And so you could say, well, I hate hamburgers. Well, yeah, that's McDonald's hamburger. So you go somewhere and you have like, oh, I'll never eat Chinese food ever again. Or I'll never have a Greek salad. That's awful. Oh, but that would be ridiculous to discount all Greek food or Chinese food because you had tried it once and you had a bad example, right? <laughs> um, Donald says, yeah, it's, it is a no win to generalize due to the, due to the exceptions and misunderstanding what people mean. And Pascaline says, I was in a punk band when I was a teen, although I was a bit shy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, um, uh, that's, the, I mean, that's the benefit of education, right? That, that, um, the more educated we are about each other and we learn about each each other and each other's cultures and backgrounds philosophies the more likely we are to um, uh, want to get to know one another and to be less combative with one another I think it's it's the fear of the unknown which motivates so much violence and hatred in the world so um, yeah, good question. Thank you, Nikki. <laughs> Sandra said, please make me a jazz playlist for painting. Uh, <laughs> Nikki says, gotcha. I w it was awesome. I heard that. Thank you for your thoughts. Huh. My favorite jazz record would be... I'm a big Miles Davis and John Coltrane fan, so I really like... Birth of the Cool, Miles Davis, in the mid '50s. That's, I'm sure if that's if you've heard that, you, you'd recognize some of those songs. Uh, um, probably the album I've listened to the most would be a Love Supreme by John Coltrane. Not ever, not everybody's cup of tea. It's kind of at the beginning when he's really starting to get more experimental. But I just that there's something about that album that's very meditative. A Love Supreme. A love supreme, a love, su and he just says that over and over. Um, another great album is Miles Davis's Bitches Brew, which is, uh, again, not everyone's cup of tea for sure. It's more experimental, Miles Davis, d the opposite of Birth of the Cool. But I think some of those more, like Love Supreme and Birth and Bitches Brew. I think because they're so wild and weird and there's a lot of improvisation going on, that for me as an artist, I found that very inspiring. It was just like, wow, you're you're hearing artists at the top of their, of their, you know, they've already established that they can do, play all the standards perfectly well. And then here they are just 
opening it all up and just being really experimental. And I think that was just, especially, at, you know, when my, you know, late teens, early 20s, that just blew my mind. It was like, wow, here's people, you know, it's, it's like the, you know, I'm a big fan of the Beatles. I really, and I like the, the later Beatles. I like the White Album. I like Abbey Road. I, you know, I like Sgt. Pepper's because that's where they're sort of the most experimental wild um, wildness going on. And I know that there's some people who'd feel the exact opposite, that the best stuff was the some of the, maybe not the earliest stuff, but that, you know, when they, you know, they really kind of hit big before, you know, Rubber Soul or something, right? Anyway, let's get back to the painting. <laughs> um, so... Let me see. Great questions, great questions. I needed I think I needed a little bit of a mental break too. <sighs> Can you believe we spent this entire time on the background and four hours in? Okay, let's let's focus on the figure of Christ in floating into the space or out of the the tomb here. Um, so And I, well, I don't want to say, <laughs> I was about to say, well, you know, there's really not that much to do at this point. That's famous last words here, Michael. Uh, so, how do we want to do this? I want to take the same color that I was just painting with here. So I, I mixed this color just to do a little bit of touch-ups and clean up some edges. And that was just white and warm yellow. I'm going to take a little bit of red. Now, I don't want to put too much in here, but I do want to get a little bit of a peachy quality going. Just to give a bit more, slight amount of warmth on his skin. And then I'm gonna I'll also build that up a little. I'll add and do one more that's a little bit, a little bit warmer even still. And I just use some glazing fluid just to thin this out a little bit. Make it a little bit easier to spread around as well. Sanders says, there's a good show on HBO called Painting with John that has John Lurie's music and it's a documentary about him painting watercolors. Oh, wow. I'm a huge John Lurie fan. That's great. One of my favorite shows of all time, top five TV shows, is called Fishing with John. I love that. If you haven't seen it, it was, I think it was on PBS 20 years ago. One of the funniest shows ever made. John Lurie is a, he was Jean-Michel Basquiat's roommate in Brooklyn. They, Jean-Michel Basquiat, the, the painter, stayed on his couch for months. And uh, they, they were in a band together back in the day. Uh, John Lurie is a musician, kind of experimental musician that has since made jazz music. Um... What is, there's an album he put out the, it's like the best of, oh, I, I can't remember. I, what, 
but fishing with John. So now that so that he's made a painting show, you need to watch Painting with John. Um, yeah, that would be awesome. I yeah, I'll definitely. I did not know that existed. I knew that he 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 basically had to give up making music because he developed some sort of uh, condition or disease that was making it impossible for him to play music. So he took up painting as kind of a therapy or a way to express himself because he couldn't make music anymore but I didn't know they made a documentary about it huh very cool thanks for the tip that is awesome yeah that's uh I'm a, yeah I got me really excited that's cool So this is going on very thin. I'm mostly just applying this to every area where there's not a really bright highlight. keep his body kind of fairly you know uh, light colored here as if it's you know I, I don't know what the I'm sure there's lots of text and stuff written on depicting Jesus you know especially as as he's risen here do does he like what's his skin like is he does he look dead or alive or is he kind of ghostly and pale or otherworldly I, I mean I don't know I don't I don't know I haven't thought about it too much but you can see that um, William Blake, anyway, is um, wants to kind of keep him kind of glowing. Marvin Pontiac. That's that's what that album, uh, John Lurie. I think it's called like the Best of Marvin Pontiac, and. And John Lurie invented this character and made made this kind of hypothetical album of this kind of lost blues jazz musician. It's you know it's kind of it, I guess you might say it's kind of silly. But he's doing it like very serious, like seriously. Like he takes, he's a, he's a, in the same way that you know, like uh, if you watch like comedians talking about their process, they take comedy very seriously. I, I lived, I I also I had a couple of roommates who were stand-up comedians when I lived in Los Angeles at one point, and um. Which I thought was going to be a lot of fun. And it was fun, but boy oh boy, when you're hanging out with comedians and you hear them sort of trying to come up with routines and stuff, it's uh, not as funny as you think it would be. <laughs> you, know, every, you know, you'd be talking to them and you'd say something kind of mildly funny and notebooks come out oh my goodness that's fun okay let me let me write that down okay let's how did you say that again let's do you mind if i use that yeah 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 no problem okay and then just 
conversation would kind of come to a halt. <laughs> um... Sure, I have that album somewhere. The, something of Marvin Pontiac, the best of, or the legend of Marvin. Sandra says, uh, yes, my, I was just thinking of it, in a small car, in a small car, in a small car, in a small car, driving, in a small car, in a small car, in a small car, driving, that's awesome, that's cool, yeah, man, I have it, that's, that is cool, <laughs> Uh, he is a character. John Lurie. Man, I haven't thought of him in a while, but... Well, you know, those stand-up comedians I lived with, they introduced me to John Lurie. I wouldn't have known about them had it not been for them. So, there you go, coming full circle. <laughs> You know, that whole Marvin Pontiac album is, you know, it, it kind of came out around the same time as that uh, Garth Brooks album. What was it? It was like the, um, where Garth Brooks kind of came up with his own alter ego, and he just got trashed in the press for that. I remember listening to it. It wasn't all that great, but people were just ridiculed Garth Brooks for... For doing that, and all I can remember thinking is, yeah, the albums aren't great, but but all the power to him. Like, you know, if he felt like he wanted to take a total left turn here and, and do something different, then you know, and, and he probably was aware that he'd upset some people, but he took the gamble, and um, it makes me want to kind of listen to it again and just see is was there any any merit to that? So I just added a bit more uh, warm red here.
you know, this color, it, you know, it's super subtle, especially on camera. But, you know, it does, you, know, you can really see how it pops against the white, right? So it just goes to show that, like, you know, you want to be, you know, it's all about subtlety. And... just up to you to, to you know it's how how far do you want to go with your with your colors Just thinking about John Lurie and, and Jean-Michel Basquiat, I think there was a falling out there. I, I think I remember seeing an interview with John Lurie, who was, I think, a little bit miffed about that relationship. And I could be totally wrong. I just have a feeling that you know Jean-Michel Basquiat was a heroin addict, right? And um. Which is was probably not super. You know, it wasn't wasn't like he was the only one in New York City in the '80s who was doing drugs. But and I probably John Lurie. I don't well, I don't know if he was into heroin or whatever. But I can imagine trying living with someone who is an addict to be just in totally intolerable. So, and I'm sure there was also some jealousy and things like that going on where, um, Jean-Michel just sort of exploded and, um, was, you know, all of a sudden a whole new group of friends kind of formed around him and anyone who had been with him for... Why does that go down? Um, might have been a little bit, you know, cast to the side, perhaps. I don't know. You know, this, I, I gotta say, as I'm working on this, I wonder, I could just use like a pencil. Like, I, like to, to bring some of these lines back, because this painting is, is very subtle. There's really not, You know, the line work is, is different than in the previous um, uh, William Blake painting we did. Now, it's this rope here. I don't want to deal with that. I think I want to make that like white or gray. I know it's it's basically the same color as his flesh here. But to me it's a little distracting. It just seems weird to be the same color. I feel like I want to change it up just a little bit. Okay. Either way, uh, let's I'm going to clean my brush. <laughs> Pascaline's going back to sleep. Good idea. Okay, so I'm making this... In fact, I'm going to just make it even more white.
So I just put some more glazing fluid in there. Oh, I guess this is still wet. Maybe I should blow dry that. You know, fishing with John, when I saw that, it was one of those things where I was like, oh man, that's, I had this feeling of like, that's what I, I had, it was like, I, this is what I wanted to do. I, I almost, it was like, I wish I had come up with this on my own. What a great idea. it's him going fishing with his friends which you know it's, but the thing is is that <laughs> everyone he goes fishing with has no idea how to fish they're just musicians and actors like Willem Dafoe and and uh, Tom Waits none of whom have the least clue on how to fish so it's very funny to see all these sort of you know uh You know, creative types, all, all men, who are, you know, not effeminate figures, but maybe not, you know, the most, um, you know, t typical, ma like, very masculine kind of fellows. And... And yet you put them in this, in a boat, and sometimes with you know, these, with actual fishermen who are guiding them on these trips, and all of a sudden they get kind of, you know, the testosterone comes out, and it's just, this is funny to me to see that uh, happening. Because it's the same sort of thing that happens amongst my friends. Most of my friends are, are musicians or artists, and, you know, or occasionally we go camping or something, and um, you know, all of a sudden, everyone is like a, a wilderness guide or something. And you're like,
Oops. I gotta say, I am, there is a temptation just to leave the painting like that. I, I do want to darken a little bit. Um, but uh, there is something I, that I, you know, I like how this, this looks um, like this. Like there's something about just the the lack of of lines or even darkness that just makes him look like he's just exploding, you know, with energy. I, I do want to maybe add, brighten up some of those highlights just a little bit, but I think before I do that, I need to go the opposite way. Now I need to darken. Because I always, I, I always like kind of pushing the boundaries out like that. I know that there's some artists and some teachers who will go like to the farthest dark and then go to the farthest light and then work their way back in. You know, if that works for you, that works totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. I always just find I like to give myself that always areas on the sides to continue to expand. I don't like when I feel like, oh, I've gone so dark. What do I do? Uh-oh. Okay, well, how do I make everything else darker to match that, you know? And, um, Painting with John was in two, done in 2001. It's all about his life on an island, and he just tells stories while they film him painting. Interesting. Um, that's wild because yeah, he there was for a while he was he was like not doing well at all. So it's good to hear that you know he's still around. And um, I mean, I I'm, I'm nervous to watch it because I'm like, oh, I hope he's just like not. Totally withered and gone.
course, I'm, uh, I was on mute. Okay, uh-oh. What was I just talking about? I can't remember. Um, oh, I was just congratulating myself on my on my gray. Just talking about how I made this gr this black using cool blue, cool yellow, and warm red. And, you know, I mixed it together, and then I added a little bit of white. And white will reveal what that gray is. If it's a little bit too purple, we need more yellow. If it's a little bit too, more, too green, we need more red. If it's a little bit too... Uh, orangey or brownish looking, we need a little bit more blue. So just the opposite color of that triad um, gets us to the color we want, right? So, let's, where should we go? Let's, um, I'm probably gonna, let's start down, I'm gonna go down to the feet where, you know, probably most people aren't gonna be looking as carefully. And that way I can practice a little bit down here and build up my confidence. Okay. Right, and there's where the the nails went into his feet there. No, I do I want to go around the outer edges with this. Kind of like that. It's very subtle. I don't even know if it, how well that's coming across on camera. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. You know, it's possible that as, as I progress, I might be like, ah, you know what, I should have done that a bit darker. That's okay. So I'm going to continue um, with with those feet and everything, but let's just move up on the body here.
didn't even realize there was a little gap between those knees there. I don't know if I need that. Thank you, uh, Sandra and Nikki, for letting me know that the volume was off there. I, I do appreciate that a lot. <laughs> Especially because there's been times where I've had it off for like 20 minutes and just been blah, 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 talking away. And then I see in the comments people are like, yeah, you've been muted forever. What are you, you're losing your mind. <laughs> I'm like, ugh, what have I done?
just gonna go to the right side and then blow dry it. So I don't have to reach over that part of the painting. Okay, so I made a little mistake anatomy-wise here. Up there.
let's get to uh, Okay, it's gonna blow dry this. Go to an even smaller brush here.
think I went a bit too far with that. Red, just bring it back down a bit. He's moving in the next couple of weeks. Oh my goodness, yes, you're right. I hate moving too. Awful. Says, uh, it's getting great. I appreciate that. Thanks, Nikki. Sandra says, I have 30 new 11 by 14 panels that came in the mail, and I have to just so next weekend for my last 30 in my 100 paintings. Awesome. My husband offered to help me just so. He's very sweet. <laughs> That's a lot of work, yeah, doing all the gessoing all of those canvases. It's good to have some help. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, let's, I'm going to darken my gray just a little bit. In fact, maybe let's just blow dry that. down to the robe. Here, let's see, belly button. Let's see, that's much darker, right? it it's just like well it's a little bit darker sure but barely and then you paint it and you're like whoa that's dark is it too dark I don't know oh my goodness I mean, that looks, that's, whew, I don't know, that's dark, I mean, it's,
Um, where, where did I see? Uh, Arda says, hey, I started painting two weeks ago. I am the most terrible painter. Any tips? Well, two weeks ago is, is not that long ago, right? I don't, first of all, I don't think you're the most terrible painter. The most terrible painter is somebody who's never painted, who's too afraid to paint. You're much better than that person. Absolutely 100% better than the person who uh, is too afraid to do what you've done. Um, it takes some time to see results. You know, I think we're, we're, we live in a, a world now where it feels like we can do anything instantly. We can press a button on our phones and order something and... 20 minutes later, somebody shows up at the door with dinner. And so we expect that we should just be able to spend a few minutes and all of a sudden we're going to get it, right? The unfortunate thing with with art and, and really anything that's important is it takes time and it takes dedication, it takes a lot of patience, and slowly but surely you get better sometimes it feel like that sometimes it feels like you go every time you do it you get further and further from your goal but you are getting further that's why it's a good idea to keep all of your artwork and never to throw anything away because if you throw things away you really do feel like nothing you're not progressing forward but if you keep your artwork and you look at it every few months you know there's going to be some where you're like wow that's amazing. I can't believe I... Wow. Man, I, I really haven't gone that far. And then you'll see a few things. You're like, whoa. Wow. I can't... That's a, I can't believe how much better I am today. And you just have to keep at it. You know, it's, it's it won't come easy, but you got to keep at it. Um, yeah, Nikki says... Um, oh, Sandra says, good night, Michael. Don't forget to watch Painting with John. Nikki says, Arda, paint slowly, no rush. If you could take a break between one and the other, you'll have more confidence over time and mastering the brush better or better. Arda says, I'm not rushing, but I can't see any results. That is what demotivates me, really. 
Nikki says, it'll be better if Michael can help you with uh, good advice. Uh, Reaper105, facts, bro, speaking facts. <laughs> w human, yeah. Um, you know, all the, all the best things in life require time and dedication. You know, it's it's a difference in going to McDonald's for for food and it comes out quick. It's not bad, but probably not something you want to live on for the rest of your life. You know, if you can help it, making your own food at home uh, is is going to be a hundred percent better than McDonald's, right? Especially you know, McDonald's is a bunch of chemicals. Nothing wrong with McDonald's. I mean, I'm a vegetarian, so I don't eat much McDonald's at all these days, but. Um, uh, I don't have anything against them. I think they do a great service. But, you know, if it's, you know, if you go to a nicer restaurant and uh, you save up some money and you go to a nice restaurant, usually it's like, wow, this is so good. And it's like, no wonder it took an hour or whatever from the moment we sat down to get food. And... Um, you know, same thing with, you know, finding, you know, getting a relationship or, you know, things take time and, um, I mean, I think that's always, it, I think it's important for things to, to go slow, right? You know, I've got a three-year-old daughter and I think the, the magic of, of life is that you know I don't it's going too fast as it is you know I um, I I don't want her to grow up any faster than she's growing but she's growing quick and uh, you know there's no hurry no hurry at all And you know, at every stage, one always feels like one is still has a long ways to go. Even myself at this exact moment, I, there's things I'm like, ah, oh, I'm still not where I want to be. Still not very good. And then, you know, I, I run into people or do these live streams and people go like, wow, you're so good. And I, sometimes it's like, really? I sometimes don't feel that way about what I'm doing. And so it's just, you know, we're all on our own individual journeys. Slowly going forward, getting better and better each day. I'm going to go into my black. Hmm. It's too dark. I think every artist, each one of like, each one of us is all we're always growing and and you know you talk to talk to anybody who's a little bit older they feel like ah you know still not as haven't read all the books I want to read or have uh, 
experienced all I want, and it's the it's the great irony of life, I think. Reaper says, Mr. Mike, do you mind if I call you that? I'm a freshman in college and I just started painting two months ago and I kind of have fallen in love with it, but I'm not sure if I should pursue it due to financial reasons. Any advice? Ooh, great question. Um, well, a few things. Um, You can you can pursue painting without going to art school. You can you can go to medical school and still make art. There's lots of people that do that. You don't have to say, well, it's either I I'm an art, if I want to do art, I have to go to art school. I mean, I teach at a, a university, so obviously I have I'm biased towards I think an art education is useful and important. Um, but you don't need to do that in order to to make art. There's, I'd say probably the vast majority of people watching, who who watch my channel, aren't people that have gone to art school. There's certainly lots of people that have and and find that you know <laughs> I'm teaching things that maybe they never learned in art school. Um, but it's okay to 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 make art on the side, and then there's the, you know the majority of art. Uh, artists over the maybe the past hundred years really were people that that did other things and as they got closer to retirement started making art um, you know it, it wasn't really common for younger people to get into to art until relatively recently um, I mean you'd have apprentice people apprenticing but um, still they would even be apprenticing for somebody for decades, you know, before they were given permission to actually do, um, paint the actual thing on their own. Contemplating leaving the face kind of like that. Um, let's go to the other hand. Um, the other thing is, you know, I've, I, I know from personal experience that the vast majority of people who become famous artists, great artists, or successful as artists are almost never the best artists, the most talented, the most skilled, the most knowledgeable, almost never, never, ever. 
the, the vast majority and almost 99% of those people who become successful artists are just those people who are determined enough to keep on going. I've, I, I mean, when I was in art school, you know, you're surrounded by people who almost everyone is better than you at doing everything, you know, and it, which is a bit of a shock because when you're in high school, you think like, wow, I'm the best artist in the classroom. No one else can draw and everyone's asking me to draw their book cover and all that kind of stuff. And you think, oh, this is great. I'm going to be like a famous artist. And then you get to art school and everybody can do that. So you're no longer the special person in the classroom anymore. You're you're just another schmuck like everybody else. And that is that's hard to deal with. And there's a lot of people that get there and realize how much work needs to be done and they're just like, "You know what? I mean, I might be really good at this, but I'm not in I have no desire to put in the the effort and the work." And then they they drop out and some of them continue making art despite not going to art school and and because again you don't need a degree in order to call yourself an artist and make art but there's a lot of them who who because of that experience stop making art entirely which is a real shame i think it's interesting that you know you know at least in western culture over the past three or four hundred years the great artists are never the greatest artists the most talented people so really the art that we have is is made by people who are just determined to make art despite not being the best at it so if you're thinking like well you know i'm 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 love doing it but i'm not the best at it well i think loving it is way more important than being good at it um and you know i, I would say that's probably about just about anything you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people like who go to medical school and are, get straight A's on everything and are, the, are, are quote unquote, maybe the most educated, knowledgeable doctors. But they end up like being like, by the end of it, I have no energy. I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I might be good at this, but I don't really want to do this. So, you know, it's, it's not just making art that falls into that category. There's lots of people that... Are, you know, and I'm sure, you know, if you think about your own experience, you know, maybe you worked at a job and there was somebody who was, you know, really good at the job, but wasn't a manager. And you're like, how is it this, this person's better at, you know, knows more about the business than the manager or the boss, the owner. Why aren't they the ones in charge? And sometimes it's because that person is not interested in running the business or whatever. That that's not what brings them satisfaction. You know, there's a, a, a really interesting book written by the, the famous tennis player from the 90s uh, named Andre Agassi. And he was an American. He's still alive t today. But he was... You know, winning all these championships, but kind of the moment that he he was able to, and his parents were kind of like pushing him to 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 play tennis, and kind of the moment he got to a certain point in his career where he could make his own decisions, he stopped playing tennis. He was like, I I hate playing tennis. I never wanted to play tennis, and my parents wanted me to play tennis, and now that I like have like some say over my destiny, I'm done. I retire. I'm out of it. And people are like, what? Are you kidding me? How can you be, you know, what a shame. You're the, you're the, you're such a great player and you're decided you're not going to play anymore. Like, oh, it's a tragedy, a travesty. And eventually he, he did make a comeback. He was like, it, but it, he had to like learn to love the sport again. Really interesting story, but that's not, an, and that's probably more the rule than the exception in almost every single field. You know, sometimes, you know, there's teachers, people who, who really, um, who don't, who, who are, are, and you know, uh, yeah, often sometimes those most talented people become teachers because they're like, yeah, you know, 
I might be really good at law, but I'd rather teach people law than practice law. I might, you know, I'm, it's just being in the courtroom or whatever is, is not as interesting to me as, as helping other people achieve their ambitions and goals. So I would say, if you have a love for making art, that's probably more important than anything else. And that will, that will sustain you much longer than talent ever will. And there's plenty of stories of Super talented people who flame out like comedians, you know, who are, who, um, who can't handle the pressure and they, you know, um, become addicted to various different kinds of drugs because they can't handle the pressure. And it's just like, what? How is it possible? This person who is so talented. Does that answer your question? Oops, sorry. Just put a, a little hole in that hand. Can't really see the other hand there. I do want... Where is the... Um, I'm getting very close to being done here, folks. Um, to this holy lance. So where was that holy lance? <laughs> Interesting. Look at all the, the various different places where that lance is said to, to, to be. But I wanted to find out... Um, um, where was Jesus stabbed with So most cruci most crucifixes show Jesus's chest wound on his right side, which is opposite from the heart cavity. Do we know for certain where he was pierced? John the Evangelist tells us that Jesus's side was pierced, but does not say which side. Crucifixes are artistic renderings, not exact reproductions. So the depiction of Christ's chest wound on the right side may be artistic symbolism. In scripture, those on Jesus' right are the ones to be saved, and they are saved by the blood that is shed from them. 
Interesting. So, what do we say on Jesus' right side? So, that's... Right. So, let's look at the original again. Do we see that wound... Does that, that to me looks like it's there, which is on the left side. So this is my right. That's on his left side. I don't know. I guess everyone's got a different, different interpretation here, hey? Well, I don't know. Does it matter? <laughs> Does it really matter? Any? Do, do you see that? Does that? To, am I just now that I'm looking for it? I see that, but I don't know. Um. Lolly says Reaper. Just to add to what Michael already mentioned, you also don't necessarily need to have to spend lots of money to create art. You can create art out of all sorts of things without a huge cost. Totally. Um, and if, even a decent set of paints and some of brushes, you'll have a great start. It doesn't need to be expensive. Good luck with it. Nikki says, I need to go to bed. It's already late around here. See you in the next video. Good night, live stream, y'all. Um, Reaper says, thank you very much, Professor Mike. I will take your words to heart, and I will keep on pushing forward. Who knows? Maybe I'll be able to join the majority of artists. I have to go to bed and wake up for a 9 a.m. painting class. I have chronic tardiness problem. Good night. <laughs> that sounds like a few of my students. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't despair. It's all of what... It's... It's... Uh, it'll come. You just have to be persistent. Okay. In fact, let's... Okay, we're almost done here. I, in fact, I'm not even sure exactly what else I want to do here, but let's uh, let's just take a look and think. Um, I'm gonna put this little wound right here here because I think that's where he painted it I'm go down to the feet and Darken this again. And maybe just get a tiny bit of this red.
Okay, I think... I think I can say... I've done my... my holy duty. <laughs> okay. So, let's take a look at how these paintings turned out side by side. I think we're done for the day. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, you found it useful, whether it's the painting or something I said, or you had a good laugh, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are taking place. Take a photograph of what you created, upload it to the Facebook group. Do it now before it's too late. Uh, if you want to support the channel with a small donation, use the PayPal link. Um, you can use Super Chat, although they take like 40% of your donation. So best is PayPal or send an e-transfer. My email is on the Facebook group and on my website. All those links are down there below. And so let's take a look here. That and that. <laughs> They're different paintings almost. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I got pretty carried away with the radiating beams of light, obviously. Um, and I was also very uh, delicate with getting too dark because I wanted if he, if it's obviously I, there's way more beams of light than his so that means it's he's like emanating all this light so it doesn't make sense for him to maybe be as dark as the image of the original right so I was kind of showed a bit of restraint there um, but uh, you know, because his, the, the light isn't nearly as bright, so it makes sense that he's also not going to be as bright. Um, you know, I didn't plan on having it so intensely bright, but once that happened, I just decided to go with it. And, and that's okay, right? Just sort of run with the painting you have, not what, not the painting you wish it would be. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bummed that the structure of the tomb entrance that I, you know, I spent probably the first hour doing that, most of that's gone, it's disappeared. You know, there, we can still barely see the blocks here, right? I mean, they're almost totally gone. You know, there's that little bit of the arch here remaining, but most of it's gone. That's okay. It's a bit of a bummer. Um... You know the the well. Let's let's zoom into a few things here. Let's let's go down to the feet. Oh, I was gonna touch up those toes, but you know what? I'm just gonna leave it like that. Not too bad. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. You know, and that's those are so small. Now, of course, he was probably working on the same size of surface, and you can see that's why he's, you know, one of the great masters of all time. And so he, but he's also using, you know, a tiny little etching tool to, to create these things, right? And probably a special pair of glasses even to, to see that. You can see that there's a little gap between these, his calves down here. Um, that I don't have. It, it's actually, you know, it, this to me makes it look like these legs, this legs maybe in front of this one, but that foot might be, so, which I don't mind, you know, it's, that it might be like that this shin is pushing that part of the muscle of the calf forward. It doesn't really bother me. It, it's not maybe totally anatomically correct. But it's not something I look at and feel like, oh, I gotta fix that. You know, whereas other, there's times where I do feel like I gotta fix that. Um, let's look at the robe here. You know, as I, I'm looking at it now, I see that the robe kind of really makes this more of like an S curve, kind of curves down, and right? Whereas mine is just basically sort of just goes right across. Um, I could have probably, certainly, go back in here and tighten that up just to make it really look like it's curving around his body but I'm gonna leave it it's it's also maybe a little heavy-handed a little bit too dark and even that was very light gray but it looks so dark 
compared to everything else, right? That's okay. I, I, I kind of prefer to be a little bit more uh, uh, noticeable than, than the, the subtle way that William Blake did his. Let's look at the hand here. I feel better about this hand than the other one. I also made, well, I don't know, maybe that is a little bit of a hole right there, although that's just his thumb. But I, I wanted to, to um, this is, you know, where the hand was nailed to the cross. So I felt like maybe because of, maybe I had this palm a little bit more turned out than uh, William Blake, I think we would see that a little bit more clearly. So I made that... Uh, I made that decision. Let's go to the opposite side. Less happy with this hand, although I don't mind it so much now that I see it. You know, it's it's hard to paint little hands at this scale. So I have to kind of be easy on myself and not get too worked up about, you know, where I've fallen short. Um, there is that little bit of black that I put in there, which is much darker than you know, these various different glazes or layers of black. So that's, you know, it's, uh, it's, if you look at it closely or not even that closely, you can see it. So it's, uh, ah. and I could try to mix that color again, but my brain is fried. It's also worth maybe just noticing the color, the, the, you know, mine has got more of a crimson, a deep kind of reddish brown color whereas his is more of like a greenish gray uh, it is not the my painting is not it is less red than it might appear on camera and then again that's just because of the settings i have my camera set at so that my hands don't look totally pale <laughs> on camera um and then so let's conclude here by looking at the face <laughs> you know it's it's funny because you know he they, they look like different figures right I, I would actually go so far as to say my version here looks maybe more like the traditional Jesus he, his hair is he's got his hair is flying all over the place um, and it seems to kind of have that same dynamic quality as the explosive light exploding from behind him out of the tomb. I don't, I don't mind how I've how I went about doing that. I think it works. Um, you know, also because of the scale, I I didn't want to do the line work on the eyelids. Uh, I was kind of afraid of just putting too much detail. Sometimes you know you gotta like. Sometimes less is more, right? And just kind of being a little bit light. I usually do a darker line on top of the eyelid. This one I just decided not to. I wanted to keep it kind of simple. On the other hand, his, you know, his Jesus here looks like he just came out of the shower or something, right? His hair is kind of pulled back and it it's, uh, um, you know, whereas my Jesus he's just blow dried his hair right sort of before and after the shower um his jesus also uses these very romanesque features that are are very typical of uh, william blake's style so in that sense like there's many aspects to this painting which are different than william blake's approach no doubt about it. I'm sure people looking at comparing these two on screen right now are like, are you kidding me? Those could be, they look like two different paintings entirely. But, you know, I, I, I it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a bad thing. Um, that, that they would differ. And, and, uh, so, Yeah, I like I like how mine turned out. I wanted to look at it, uh, Thursday's painting as well. I think which should I put this one on this side, or let's let's do it in the proper 
chronological order here. Here we've got the um, crucifixion there on the left and the resurrection there on the right. Kind of a nice little um, diptych here where we see, you know, very different kind of quality of these radiating beams of light, right? The, this here is very warm colors, you know, and Christ's body is kind of gray or greenish as well as a little bit orange, whereas the figure of Albion, Albion, however it's said, you know, is, is more fleshy colored and a little bit more purples. And, um, versus this one here, we have this, you know, Christ is risen and the light is, is kind of cleaner, holier, more, um, uh, you know, more hopeful, the expression I've managed to do is maybe is kind of hopeful, I would like to think. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see them side by side now that they're completed. I was hoping that we would arrive to something like this. Uh, I, I was expecting it to use a bit more cool yellow, and this one ended up a lot more white. But it is, it's, that is a really interesting diptych. I, to see them side by side like that is kind of wild. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting because these are from two totally different poems um, or books. You know, this one is part of a, a, a poem called Jerusalem. Not, not the short hymn that is so, so well known in England, but um, the a, a, a kind of really what William Blake considered to be his masterpiece. And then this one here, I don't think is part of a text. It might just be an, a, a print that was done on its own, I think. Um, and, and much more closely follows the biblical story, because obviously in the Bible, Albion isn't there, and Christ is not nailed to the tree of knowledge. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, I, I could th see myself, I, in fact, I was even thinking earlier um, when I was doing these illustrations to maybe give him the same kind of wrap around his waist here. Um, you know, it makes me think like, you know, we could have had this this fabric kind of blowing off in the distance behind him or, you know, weaving its way down here. I think that could have looked cool as well. But that's a different painting. <laughs> right? Uh, okay. Wow, we are almost six hours into this, folks. Thanks so much for painting along with me. <laughs> Lolly says, pre and post shower Jesus. I love it. <laughs> okay, everyone, it's been a, been a blast. Thank you so much for spending part of your Easter with me and um, uh, learning a little bit about painting. I hope you enjoy the rest of your holiday, should you still have a little bit left. And I just want to express my, my eternal gratitude to be able to um, share with you my love of painting, and I hope that... Um, I hope that that in some small way encourages you to pursue whatever interest you might have, whether it's art or something else, but um, do whatever it is that you love and do it with passion and energy and good things await. Okay, everybody, enjoy your night. I will grab some food now. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you again on Tuesday. I don't even know what we're doing on Tuesday. Can't wait to find out. <laughs> Good night, everybody.